Okay, so uh, the last chapters of Human Action. Yeah. I'm doing the study guide with uh, Robert Murphy. I have not read his summary in ages. I've just been reading the book over and over again. Yeah. Listening to it in the car. I should read the study guide, but I didn't. Yeah, I uh, went over the study guide a little bit. I like his questions. I don't care as much about the um, summary. I should, though. Yeah, I think it's good. It synthesizes the information. Okay, so I think we're on chapter 36, the crisis of interventionism. Right. The crisis of interventionism. All right. Well, wait a minute. Did we do um, the welfare principle versus the market right principle? Oh, maybe we didn't. Last... Uh, yeah, we did. We did economics yeah. of war and then the welfare principle versus the market principle. Yeah. Crisis of interventionism, 36. Yeah, you're right. Short questions. Uh, study question number one. The harvest of interventionism. Comment. Quote. Interventionism has exhausted all its potentialities and must disappear. Mm. Two, the exhaustion of the reserve fund. What is the essence of interventionist policy? The essence of interventionism is to lavish generous benefits and spending on the working class while requiring employers or the rich to pay for these items. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's like a disguised word for just theft. Right. The rich. Like. Yeah. I'm just going to take... It's It presupposes that all rich people's wealth... It's mine. I get to decide how it's spent. I yeah. can just take it. Um, comment. From day to day, it's become more obvious that large-scale additions to the amount of public expenditures cannot be financed by soaking the rich, but that the burden must be carried by the masses. Uh, section 3. The end of interventionism. What are the three reasons that will lead interventionism to an end? Um, running out of money would be one. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if that's really what he's going for. So first, restrictive measures by their nature cannot constitute a system of production. Uh, right. Second, all varieties of intervention in the market fail to achieve the very end sought by their authors. These failures, in turn, spur only further in interventionism. Third, interventionism aims at seizing the surplus from gr one group and giving it to another. Once the surplus is gone, interventionism must end. So, for one, it doesn't produce anything. For two, it doesn't produce the desired result, and so that leads to more of it. And then third, you eventually run out of surplus to give away. So. Yeah. Uh, these three things work together to end interventionism on its own course. What three statements can be made about the struggle between the principles of private ownership and public ownership? Three statements can be made, huh? I don't know. It sounds like he's looking for something very specific. Mm. 
Uh, here we go. Juan. We have no knowledge, whatever, about the existence and operation of agencies which would bestow final victory in this clash on those ideologies whose application will secure the preservation and further intensification of societal bonds and the improvement of mankind's material well-being. Nothing suggests m the belief that progress toward more unsatis- uh, excuse me. Nothing suggests that the belief that progress toward more satisfactory conditions is inevitable or a relapse into very unsatisfactory conditions impossible. Which is a terrifying statement. <laughs> Two, men must choose between the market economy and socialism. They cannot evade deciding between these alternatives by adopting a middle-of-the-road position, whatever name they may give to it. And three, in abolishing economic calculation in general adoption of socialism, excuse me, in abolishing economic calculation, the general adoption of socialism would result in complete chaos and the disintegration of social cooperation under the division of labor. Which is, it makes perfect sense. He said that um, the socialist economies base a lot of their, their prices for things on capitalist economy prices. Mm -hmm. If there were no capitalist economy prices on which to base the, the prices for things, there would be no way to make economic calculations at all. Right. All right. That was a good chapter. Interventionism gone. The Nondescript Character of Economics, Chapter 37. The Singularity of Economics. Why aren't economic theorems open to falsification or verification by experience? Because that's, that's not how they work. That's economic history. It's not... Um, economics isn't decided by, like, scientific experiment. Yeah, it's, that's what uh, I was thinking. It's deductive. Um, a prioristic. Mm -hmm. Two, economics and public opinion. And comment... The supremacy of public opinion determines not only the singular role that economics occupies in the complex of thought and knowledge, it determines the whole process of human history. Yes. Hmm. On which factor does the flowering of human society depend on? I would say the, I guess the, the economics they adopt. Yeah, yeah, and the the knowledge that they have of economics, yeah, or lack thereof. I think the, the analogy I always think of is, you know, when you have like a a really cold bottle of water that hasn't frozen yet. Yeah. And some, when you shake it, like it it starts to freeze. It but could crystallize. Yeah. Yeah, and like. The, the way it crystallizes is based on how the very first, like, the, the very first molecule, molecule like, uh, crystallizes. Right. And then everything on the outside is just, like, a product of that. Yeah. So I think of, like, economies, like, you know, the rules they adopt or the economics. Absolutely. Like a seed. Yeah. Three, the illusion of the old liberals. Which fact had been neglected by the old liberals with regard to public opinion? What were its consequences? Probably that um, public opinion didn't matter would be my guess. Um, that they would, they would be wrong about that. The... The liberal philosophers of the Enlightenment made one fatal mistake. 
They assumed that the great majority would support capitalism because of its undeniable benefits and their assumed ability to reason correctly. Oh, yes. Whoops, I recall now. The old liberals failed to anticipate the success of anti-capitalist propaganda, specifically the ability of Marxists to convince the masses of even the Western countries of their progressive, immersive, contrary to obvious facts. Yeah, that's um, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow, we're flying by this. Boom. The place. Oh, let, let me. Uh, yeah. Okay, chapter 38, The Place of Economics in Learning. In this chapter, Mises discusses the historical evolution of economics from a vocation into a profession. His description of economic education at both the elementary and university, university level remains accurate to this day. This chapter, along with the previous one, assists the proponent of Misesian theory in understanding the difficulties to be faced in spreading correct ideas. Okay, uh, the study of economics. What is the radical... I don't know how to say that. How do you say that word? Epistemological. Epistemological. Difference between the natural sciences and the sciences of human action. Well, the natural sciences have to do with measurements. Mm -hmm. And... Um, things that can be um, predicted by those measurements, but human action isn't about um, measurements in the, the real world. It's about um, like factors leading to decisions like a person acts because he expects um, to gain or to produce some sort of result. Yeah. Um, you don't know exactly when a thing is going to happen um, because the, the factors, there's there are so many factors at play um, that can impact any decision at any time. It's not like you can have a uh, completely closed environment mm -hmm. um, and reproduce those results every time right like in a science lab which insights of economic history can be helpful for economics as such uh, I'm not sure but I mean seems like they provide good examples um, when like it, it's nice to do like thought experiments of like a, a social socialism run country but I don't know it's much easier to just see it play in real life 
How do you mean? Like, um, I guess this is talking about economic history, but like we can like look back at um, different countries that have adopted socialism mm -hmm. and use them mm -hmm. as examples. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not just like these thought experiments. Yeah. You're like, under these conditions, we expect this to occur. And, mm -hmm. oh, look, it does every time. Yeah. Like, so you, you can use these examples to make sure your theories are consistent. Mm -hmm. Like, so your theory should be consistent, like, with all these different scenarios and be able to explain them. Yeah. Comment. Quote. Economics, like logic and mathematics, is a display of abstract reasoning. Right. Two, economics as a profession. What is the connection between the professional economist and interventionism? They're always trying to, like, fit things into their perfect models. They're like, oh, well, if I, if I draw this chart, this is where the equilibrium is, and so we need to make it fit this diagram that I made. Yeah. So we need to have interventionist policies so that we can make it go to equilibrium because it's, it's not right. Mm -hmm. it's, instead of, like... Um, rather not intervening and allowing the market to decide where equilibrium belongs. Right. <laughs> I, I wonder if they like, you know, renamed like the cabinet me member to like chief interventionist mm. <laughs> instead of like chief economist, what effects it would have. They probably wouldn't look down on that type of title. They perceive intervention as benevolent hmm. and helpful right i think they're wrong how does interventionism imply that a political career is only open to people who identify themselves with the interests of a pressure group because the interventionists on behalf of the farm farmers only care about increasing the price of wheat and, and grain or whatever the farmers want. And the interventionists on behalf of the, 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 the politicians who are paid off by labor only care about raising union wages. Mm -hmm. So all interventionism, if you're going to intervene in the market on behalf of something politically... Um, of course, they're identified with some sort of interest or pressure group. Right. Forecasting as a profession. What would it imply if it were possible to calculate the future state of the market? I'm still on this last question, though. I'm oh. thinking about. Well, I mean, it makes it would have made sense given the pause to move on, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm questioning groups like the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute, or there are interest groups that are free market interest groups, and I wonder who, if, if Mises would agree that there. What they're doing is interventionism um, because they're trying to disintervene. Um, and are they, are they part of like a pressure group or an interest group? Like the Koch brothers pays off these, mm -hmm. these groups to be like, hey, help keep my wages low um, by keeping the market free. Like if I were to pay someone to, to lobby at the Concord State House on behalf of free market principles because I think it will benefit me and that I can have more profit. Am, am I just as bad as the um, 
you know, union? Mm, I mean, so you're you're paying someone, so presumably, I don't know it. Are you really? Just, are you not acting in self-interest? Like, could someone lobby, like, uh, more? Like, would this benefit you more than someone else? I don't know. I, yeah, I would like to see everyone benefit, but presumably, if I were the Koch brothers and I were paying these real organizations to lobby on my behalf. I would expect to gain more politically than I'm paying in dollars. Like I can I can get more dollars if they free up this market. Yeah. So I'm going to pay $10,000 to this lobbyist to get $5 million from the state. Yeah. Um, or $5 million opened up in opportunities. So I guess it really depends on like what freeing up the market is yeah like i don't imagine when mises wrote this that there were a that there was a cato institute or there were any free market um interventionists anyway i'll have to ponder on that more later three uh forecasting as a profession you you just read this um yeah the question was what would it imply if it were possible to calculate the future state of the market I mean, it it would imply that like uh, whoever's predicting it is like omniscient. Like they can predict like human uh, human subjective. Like their I guess value is not subjective. If that was the case. Or you're omnipotent and you can evaluate that. I think that is true and correct, and that the the answer that um, Robert Murphy is probably looking for is that it implies that there would be no profit to be gained uh, if everyone knew if it was rather if it was possible to calculate the future state of the market. Yeah. Then entrepreneurs could just right. calculate it and yeah. know, and then no one would have any profit because mm -hmm. they would all do the right thing how does interventionism oh no I'm not right what distinguishes business people from statisticians with regard to uncertainty of the future hmm that one's kind of confusing. I assume a business person is a statistician. Oh, you you think they well they it's use the same, stats, right? Yeah, I would say it's the same person. Presumably, a business per person would would also hire statisticians to um, work out expected um, profits. Yeah, but if you're making decisions, you need to understand statistics. Hmm. Well, what distinguishes business people from statisticians with regard to the uncertainty of the future? I, I would say, you know, statisticians don't put anything on the line by their, by their nature. It's a, the, they, they might, but it's not um, a given. Business people are putting something on the line. They're actually making a bet as to what's going to happen in the future. But putting staking something down, it's like I'm gonna make ten thousand of these widgets, because I expect they're gonna sell for a lot more next year. What are the status? The statisticians are making bets too. They're making predictive models, and if their models are garbage, they won't have a job. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're making any widgets. They might just do a calculation, but they're not producing a, a widget. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd, it, I don't know what he means by statistician. I'd well, I imagine if I'm Mattel, a toy company, yeah, I would, I'm a business person, I'm the CEO, I would hire a statistician and say, hey, 
what do you think the condition of the market is next year for this Tickle Me Elmo doll versus this um, Sour Patch Kid doll? The statistician would work it out, but he doesn't have anything on the line. The CEO is the one who's like, all right, we're going with Tickle Me Elmo. But, like, I, I just I don't get why you you assume that the CEO isn't the stat, like, statistician. Like, this... Would the, then you could just say like the CEO is also like, you know, delegating his decision making too. Like, why does he? Why does the CEO delegate the, the calculation part and like not the decision part? Right? Well, it's what distinguishes them, right? That's the question. What What's the difference between a business person and a, and a person who works out facts and figures? Like, yes, the business person probably does work out facts and figures, but the difference is he has something, he has skin in the game. Don't you think? I mean, what, am I missing I, something? I think this, like, the stat, like, I just think it's the same. Maybe I don't understand. I have a different um, idea of what a statistician is. Like, well, what is it? I think it's anybody using statistics to make any decision. Okay. Yeah. But that doesn't imply that they have any stake in the results or any, like, skin in the game. Just working out of a, a calculation doesn't mean that you actually own something. So I guess the, the question with regard to uncertainty of the future. And so statisticians make these predictive models and make decisions based on that and i guess a business person is doing the same exact thing they're both using predictive models too so i i, I just i don't know what the difference between them are and you can't think of any difference between a statistician and a business person? I guess I don't know what the d the definition of a business people or a statistician is. Yeah. Like, a statistician may not be in business. Oh, okay. So I, so you're talking about like a, an academic. Yeah. Or a, just a hired so, person. Like an accountant. Like a, an accountant can project for me what my future yeah. profits will be. Well, why doesn't it say an entrepreneur? It says business people. And so it, it sounds like the, the question you're answering is what's the mm. difference between an entrepreneur and an academic. Right, and but I that's agree not with, what's asked. It, yeah. Yeah. So, so. I, I, like, um, I, I find it really strange that, like, the university, like, has, like, a business school and then, like, a math school and where, like, I think they should be the same person. Let's see. The context of this chapter is about like universities and um, academics, as you put it. So maybe it's just misworded. He meant entrepreneur versus academic, in which case I agree with your answer. Here's the um, section from the book. The recurrent boom-bust cycles caused by credit expansion naturally led businesses to employ economists for assistance in predicting the turning point. However, economists know only that the boom, uh, that the bust must follow the malinvestments engendered by the boom. They cannot predict the precise timing of events. Furthermore, the successful entrepreneur needs not merely accurate forecasts, but forecasts better than those of his rivals. If everyone knew the date of the business downturn, no one could profit from such knowledge. Hmm. hmm. But that's not. Uh, that doesn't go into the. Maybe what I think. So it's. I guess it's the difference between investing based on fundamental analysis, versus on technical analysis. Hmm. Well, that's that's a new idea. 
I think that's maybe a modern day kind of thing of what he's saying. You could be right there. I'm I'm looking into the text of the book. Okay. In in fact, both the economists and the businessmen are fully aware of the uncertainty of the future. The businessmen realize that the economists do not dispense any reliable information about things to come and that all they provide is interpretation of statistical data referring to the past. Oh, okay. For capitalists and entrepreneurs in the economists' opinion about the future count only as questionable conjectures. They are skeptical and not easily fooled. But as they quite correctly believe that it is useful to know all the data which could possibly have any relevance for their affairs, they subscribe to the newspapers and periodicals publishing the forecasts. Anxious not to neglect any source of information available, big business employs staffs of economists and statisticians. Mm. I think Mises is missing a big thing here. What and is that's that? uh, futures markets. He says that statisticians are only um, thinking about what's happened in the past. Well, their statistical data by their nature can only come from data that arrived in reality at some point during the, in the past. Yeah, but futures let you um, uh, use statistics based on what you know, people think is going to happen in the future. Yeah. No, I don't I don't think Macy's yeah. is is leaving that out at all. He says uh in fact, both the economists and the businessmen are fully aware of the uncertainty of the future. The businessmen realize that the economists do not dispense any reliable information about things to come. And that all they provide is interpretation of of statistical data referring to the past. So you're saying, well, no, some statisticians. Yeah, futures give you a, a predictor of what's like. But it's only coming from information that's from the past, right? Yeah, that's the right. only way. It yeah. Can... And business forecasting fails in the vain attempts to make the uncertainty of the future disappear and to deprive entrepreneurship of its inherent speculative character. Okay, so forecasting is a profession Both of them, uh, with regard to uncertainty of the future, they both know that they don't know the future. Mm -hmm. The difference is um, Capitalists and entrepreneurs, the economists' opinions about the future count only as questionable conjectures. So I guess they, the business people are less apt to, be, to believe that the, the statisticians are correct. I don't know. This I don't know. A... I'm over this question. All right. Um, for economics and the universities. What observation does Mises make regarding tax-supported universities and their recruitment policies? He was like, it's not fair. There's, these people have, uh, they can propagandize the children and make them believe anything they want. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. There's some, like, a uh, part of the, the program I'm at in university uh, uh, at UNH, like there's another class that's like, oh, I want to say it's like economic thinking for like social justice or something. 
is the title of the class. It's like, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> that it's like not even teaching them anything. It's just like filling their head with ideas. You think it's uh, it's like a brainwashing class? Yeah. Yeah. But also he said that um, like television and, well, he didn't say television, he said radio and, and like periodicals, um, newspapers were more, more powerful than the education system. I don't think that's true. I mean, maybe, but maybe now, like, but I don't know. I think it's pretty powerful that, you know, you have someone going to public school from age five to 18, in some cases, 22 for six hours a day. Like, it seems like you're pretty systematized at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, like, people can't, like, it, it's really interesting, like, when people think about Bitcoin, like, a lot of them really can't understand the concept of money and, like, how the dollar might not be the best money. Like, they're so systematized that, like, it, they just, they can't even think that way. Yeah. But on the other hand, when a popular Netflix documentary comes out and everyone absorbs it, everyone's automatically all on the same page about that new concept. Yeah, true. I guess it scales better. Yeah. So whereas they may have not learned about um, problems in the criminal justice system, they they watch uh, to Making a Murderer or something, and that everyone knows about this is like, oh, yeah. Yeah, but like how, how deep is the, I guess, the indoctrination then? Like if it's just a one-hour Netflix thing and you get all like up in a bunch, like you, you don't like how, but like how long does that like, actually last versus like someone who's been in the school system for that long and now they're like 50 60 and like it's still with them hmm. what are the objectives of universities well i would think it's it's to grow knowledge yeah. Um, but also, he's sort of leading. This is like a leading question. Isn't this the chapter where he talks about, like, how... Oh, yeah, this is... He says, so I'll read all three questions. What is the scholastic tradition... What does the scholastic tradition require? Why is it useless to divide economics into different branches? Why is there only one coherent body of economics? So this was the whole section on um, economics professors who are unsatisfied with the um, teaching of economics will venture into economic history or economic theory of this one particular realm. And then the scholastic tradition requires that they, they build on that somehow. So they need to write a book on this type of economics and then they, they want to pretend like this is economics but really it's just it's a study of history it's not the economics itself mm -hmm. and so why is it useless to divide economics into different branches why is there only one coherent body of economics but that's the reason there's no economics of this thing and that thing there's there's just one unifying theory of you're telling me there's no economics of social justice? <laughs> um, maybe there is. Uh, I'll keep an open mind. Uh, comment. However, what has made many of the present-day universities, by and large, nurseries of socialism is not so much the conditions prevailing in the departments of economics as the teachings handed down in other departments. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just the, the liberal arts school. Right. He says it's it's the other departments. 
so like in economics, you sometimes will often, well, you will often find in universities economics professors who teach real economics, but it's in philosophy and art and history and yeah. these other courses where they're like, even some sciences where they 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 teach phony economics. Yeah, and it, that is where the socialism pervades. It's through. interesting. I'm kind of watching this now of how how it's crept into the the SEP school or the College of Engineering and Physical Science and the avenue is through this environmental engineering study. Hmm. And that's where you get most of the, the lefties and the um like the science. Like that's where they're going is the environmental engineering. And uh what's an example of, of something that is um like um left thinking um well so non economic scientific well cuz a lot of the engineering has to do with um you know you have to come up with projections of like pricing and stuff and like the justification is more of like they'll they'll treat it as like a public good or like their calculations will involve like um like socialist ideas i guess mm. and whether it's a viable project or not it's like, like essentially like you know a lot of the things you find in like the green new deal i'm sure have a lot of environmental engineering backing i i can imagine and also oh, i just want to and then and then there's a huge push because you know like they get this green new deal like it they they have a lot of work and they'll be probably become a lot really rich off of it the environmental en engineers right so they say okay we want this result which is like a reduction in carbon such and such um by this time and so in order to get there we have to do this and that thing yeah the environmental so engineer is very it will become a lot more in demand mm -hmm. and so but um maybe the economic theory that they're lacking is that um the cost projection is is one thing but then the opportunity cost of switching over too soon before your old machinery runs out and just buying new machinery that's uh, wind powered or solar yeah. powered, it's like that's destructive because you're not using up what you already have. You're just destroying right. the things that you have that work and you're going to produce less output with more energy, which is bad for consumers and bad for the environment too. So it's, they're just not thinking. Right. Okay. General education and economics. Comment. Quote. In the domestic aspects of history, the teachers or the textbook authors' own social philosophy colors the narrative. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Why does general education only play a minor role in the formation of political, social, and economic ideas of the rising generation. Yeah, because there are other influencers that are daily um, affecting public opinion, like newspapers and um, television. Mm -hmm. Economics and the citizen. What is the primary civic duty in our age, according to Mises? I would say to, to act in your own self-interest. I would say it's to learn economics. It's the... Yeah. That's probably it. But, I mean, they're probably, like... They're one and the same if you're acting your own self-interest. Yes, I think it's very important to always act in your self-interest, but I think Mises might say that you're always acting in your self-interest no matter That's what. Tr that is true. The, the primary civic duty in our age is to learn economics because um, it produces better outcomes for life. Seven, economics and freedom. And comment, prices, wage, wage rates, and interest rates... No, interest rates and profits 
are dealt with as if their determination were not subject to any law. Right. Like, oh, we can just adjust this or that thing. Um, and that won't have any effect on, on the prices or the interest rates or the wage rates. And of course they will. Yeah. Every law does. All right. Chapter 39. The last chapter. Economics and the Essential Problem of Human Existence. Section 1. Science and Life. What is it meant by work Fahrenheit? <laughs> How is it considered in modern science? I don't remember this. Well, I could possibly read a, an exact definition. It is customary to find fault with modern science because it abstains from expressing judgments of value. Living and acting man, we are told, has no use for Wordfreiheit. He needs to know what he should aim at. If science does not answer this question, it is sterile. Hmm. But it doesn't tell us what Wordfreiheit is. I think we're supposed to know this already from previous chapters. But I don't recall. Um, where do I hide? Is that where? It's like a German word for a, a sense of this is what you should be doing. You this is the. I'll look it up. Yeah, will you please? Because my phone is is occupied with recording. Science does not value, but it provides acting man with all the information he may need with regard to his valuations. It keeps silence only when the question is raised whether life itself is worth living. So what is Wertfreiheit? Uh, the definition is freedom from value. Judgments. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, science is supposed to be objective. Yeah, but living and acting man need to needs to know what to aim at. He needs to have values. Mm. Right. Well, I mean, the question is, how is it considered in modern science? And I'll just read the comments. So, comment, science does not value, but it provides acting man with all information he may need with regard to his valuations. Second comment. The subjective matter of praxeology is merely the essential manus... Manifestation, manification of human life is an action. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm hmm. Economics and judgments of value. In what sense can an economist call a policy good or bad? I would say if it if it produces the if it is likely to produce the result that is aimed at. Yeah. So if you're like I want to um see wage rates increase then uh, will this policy do that or not? So an economist can say that it's good or bad in 
achieving its aim, not that it's a it's qualitatively good to um, create a minimum wage law, for example. Like I might say that's that's bad, but will it produce the result that's aimed at? Yes. It's, so it's it's good in the economic sense. An econo economist could call policy good or bad if it will do what it, it's intended. What if it has side effects? Well, it, it, I don't think the economist can make a, a moral claim about good or bad. Just the good or bad oh, okay. to an economist yeah. is will it do what it's intended to do. Okay. How does the economist answer the objective... Or, excuse me. How does the economist answer the objection that people do not always strive for material well-being. Uh, I would say that he, an economist acknowledges that people are, are always acting rationally. Um, and that, that may not be to strive for material well-being. They may be aiming for other... Um, let me see. Yeah. Uh, another common objection is that economists assume people are only concerned with material well-being, when in reality people care about irrational objectives as well. Okay, so I, I misspoke. The objection is baseless because economics deals with action as such. There is no assumption that the action is directed toward material ends. So some people want things that are irrational. But it doesn't matter that it's always a rational action because they're aiming mm -hmm. at that. Um, in what way is economics apolitical or non-political? I mean... Like it, it doesn't care about your political views. It's just like the science. Yeah, it's going to tell you what's going to happen. Yeah. You do this, that's going to be the result. You do this, that's going to be the result. It doesn't matter um, yeah, what the politics are. Three, economic cognition and human action. How is man's freedom to choose and act restricted? And here's a comment. But if they fail to take the best advantage of it and disregard his teachings and warnings, they will not annul economics. They will stamp our society and the human race. Mm -hmm. Race. Mm -hmm. Human freedom to act and choose is restricted in three ways. First, there are the physical laws of nature. Second, there are the individual's innate constitutional characteristics and environment. And third... There is the regularity of phenomena due to the connection between means and ends. It is the third restriction on unbounded human choice that is the subject of praxeology. The end. Cool. Wow. We read all this. <laughs> That's crazy. It's a lot of words. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I I enjoyed it. Definitely. I don't know. It maybe it'll be interesting to like listen to the first few. And see how far. I feel like I've come a long way in the last year or so hmm. through reading this book. Me too. And understanding. Yeah. Um, 
I, I feel like I, I know. I, there's a lot I still don't know. I could do this whole thing again. Right. <laughs> I, I feel like in no way an expert. Like I've just begun this, this journey. But I'm excited. Um, I looked up human action or rather another study guide by Robert Murphy is yeah. available on Nisis.org. And they accept Bitcoin. Oh, cool. So I purchased um, Man, Economy, and State yeah. by Murray Rothbard in um, paperback. And then also the study guide to go along with it. Oh, cool. I For myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'd do this again. With the, okay. With yeah. another book? Yeah. Great. Cool. Yeah, Man, Economy, and State... Uh, he says that it's uh, in the summary that it's more about teaching economics. Mm-hmm. Like this isn't, it's more like philosophy and the man economy and state is like actually teaching economics. Mm. Okay. So that should be great. Yeah. I want to be an economics expert. Me too. <laughs> okay. Well, this has been great. Yeah. Good job.